Just ban Gyro, says Loader. Just pick Deucer, says ROTK. It's day one of the main event. Yes, it's the end of day one at the main event of TI9. After a, a long day off, we finally got to the main stage. We got to see Gabe Newell. We got to see six series, four best of four eliminations. Long, long day. I think a lot of nervous teams getting not only their first time on the main stage, but also, you know, one game elimination. So some long games in there as well. With me, Marco and Adam. Marco, welcome back. After a short mini hiatus, we're here for the main thing. The real deal, the main event. How are you? Hey, I'm doing very well. Super psyched for the main event. I am pretty sad, pretty happy. A lot of mix of emotion today. Um, but yeah, super good first day main event. Yeah. Adam, likewise. Welcome. How was your first day? Pretty good? Living up to the expectation or? or? Uh, I liked the ambiance. That was pretty cool. A lot of <laughs> high production value stuff. I thought the Dota was a little... Um, Left a little to be desired. Well, I mean... It was hype, but it was kind of boring. I don't know what the word is. Syndrome. People were a little too uh, scared. I feel like a little too scared for my taste. Yeah, it's only natural with a best of one when there is so much on the line. Just financially, if you win that best of one, you're winning. I think tens of thousands, if not hundred thousand, of dollars. So it it does make sense that there's a lot of conservative gameplay, and I think day one is always gonna be worse than the other days but they get rid of all the best of ones in one day so that's a positive yeah yeah i think you get about two to three hundred thousand for the best of one yeah pretty bonkers let's just kick right away because we've got a lot to talk about um first series of the day or oh, actually should we want to have a quick word on the production value the yeah, opening that's ceremony and stuff yeah i mean it is incredible how good TI is. Valve has so much money to just pump into opening ceremonies and content and everything. Um, my favourite part about the opening ceremony is when all the teams come out. I don't know about you, Adam. That's a pretty cool part. That or... was pretty cool. They kind of messed it up, though. That was kind of sad. They, <laughs> yeah, like, they get the they teams said, wrong. Yeah, they? they said Fanatic about two or three times, and then like <laughs> Infamous just bottles out. Nobody cheers, because it's like, that's not Fanatic. And they just have to stand over to the side. And then like they they say TNC and they boo cuckoo. It's like oh. yeah, that was rough. That was rough when that happened. Also, they get the wrong side because teams were coming out of both ends, and they yep. had, they'd film one end, and then Empty the team hallway. would just come out the other end. <laughs> yeah. And also, they they have the the I guess they're Chinese fans. You know, the ones that were wheeled out in little groups, one right, yeah, one by one to like high five, yeah. They were funny as well. I, I loved it when um, Vici Gaming, I believe, came out right near the start. And the people that they clearly didn't know what team they were going to get to high five. And when it turned out to be the softest hands in esports, they were so excited because obviously Chinese team. So yeah. they were like so excited they got them rather than they get to high five Senenko or like something Ice 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 but... just like said, nope. He just yeah. dodged everybody. That was quite funny, yeah. Um, and then Gabe Sandals. Pog, Gabe's, that's always good to see. Gabe Sandals, he tried a little bit of Chinese. He gave his wave and he just noped out of there and we won't see him again. That's <laughs> Yeah, me and Marco were talking about what he does during this week. Whether he watches or whether it's just pure business deals, shaking hands with Chinese businessmen across Shanghai for a week and then flying back to Seattle. Oh, I, I think it's a mix of both. Yeah, he probably, I'm sure he must watch some. Oh, for sure. I just think, yeah. I think with this trip, it's probably a little bit more business deals. Like if it was in Seattle, I think you'd watch most of it. Right. Yeah. But when you're in Shanghai, yeah, this needs to be conducted. First series of the day we got was this upper bracket matchup between LGD and VP, a clash of the Titans straight off the bat. Um, OD fault, no holds bar, great way to start. Um, Game one, I think VP, they started well. They picked a brewmaster, which looked really good for about the first. first. Pick. Yeah, yeah, first time picked in the tourney. 
Yeah, the first pick of the tournament. They have a funky draft. They have this... Not only do they have a Pasha Brewmaster, but they also have no one Dazzle Mid. Sort of kind of four protect one with Morph. And the first two team fights where they use Global and Primal Split look really good. And then it just sort of fell apart. Um, Adam, you saw this game of... I mean, you was, you hadn't even gone to bed yet, so... Yeah, I was up. This was live. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what, I think you covered it well. Solo had some really sick globals. Really nice... Um, the Tidehunter would ravage, like Chalice would ravage, and then you immediately follow it up with a, with a global, and mm. PSG can't do anything after that. You can't even anchor smash. You can't even finish off people. And then... You can also just Brewmaster split and uh, throw throw the tide up in the air and take a fight that way. And I thought the first 15 to 20 minutes, maybe the first 15 minutes, VP uh, played really well, and it looked like it was going to work out. And then they just had – the brew like fell off mega hard, mm-hmm. and they went for the Morphling Earthshaker – meme you know with the ads yeah, where you just ads, become yeah. an earth shaker and it's kind of happened a little too late got mm-hmm. a little too farmed on on lgd i think looking at all all the vps heroes bar the morph like an, a shaker panda dazzle silencer they all drop off when bqbs come online for lgd so 22 minutes you've got sven and gyro with 10 second bkbs and you've also got a blink on sven at that point in time as well they're, they've got nothing that can stop them. A morph can't deal enough damage at 20, 25 minutes in the game. You've got four heroes with nothing but spell kits that now are ineffective for 10 seconds, and Sven and Gyro are just going to wipe the bruise, broodlings. Dazzle oh, really struggles to offer much going into the mid-game when you've got lots of wave clear, because one of Dazzle's pros is, yeah, you get all your necro book stuff going, but I don't think a Gyro or Sven care about that. Silencer global's amazing, but not when you can just pop BKBs and kill heroes. So, looking at the draft, I didn't see the game. It does look like VP needed to stomp. They definitely did, yeah. They had a much faster time, and they were ahead. It was a classic dazzle where you put this dazzle mid, and yeah, you have really good damage with like your shadow word, the heal bombs, and obviously earlier in the game, you can even run heroes down with poison touch. And it feels amazing. You feel like you're a damage dealing mid that's running around doing stuff. And then suddenly, like you said, it gets to the point where they have BKBs on L- on LGD, and it's like, oh, you, really all you offer is a shallow grave and a Greaves on obviously bad Juju cooldown. It's like suddenly like, why did we, we've got this Dazzle hero that's our second highest farm priority yeah. dealing no damage. He and won also, mid, and yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say another point was Ramsey's, he started building Lincolns, and VP were so far ahead that he didn't buy Manta Recipe or he didn't buy um, one component of Lincoln's and went to start building Ags. He bought like... The point the, booster. He bought the po- Yeah, he bought the point booster of Ags and then they took a team fight when he could have had Lincoln's and he got bursted instantly with something like... I don't think it was late enough for Orchid on Sven. I think it was some some way he got maybe just an Ogre stun or something. And he just got probably Blink Lift and a... Yeah. Like Ogre... Or Sven, they yeah. had a lot of a lot of stuns, or even a rocket. Um, you got punished for not finishing the Lincolns. Yeah, for sure. The last also, thing I would say. Oh, okay. sorry. No, I was just gonna say uh, they picked they picked Brew right, and they had uh, a Dazzle that had a level one Necro book. He kept it a level one Necro book, but they had Gyro and Sven on yeah. PSG, so they just didn't care about Broodlings. They were cleaving. Yeah. And they were also just farming necro books over and over and over again. Two hundred gold every time. My final comment is links to that in the Dazzle and Brew. It's a lineup where you need to be kind of winning the game by twenty, so you need to be looking to take objectives, use your early game advantage. One of the one of the scariest sites is when there's a dazzle with loads of little minions and you can't wave clear. Like we've said, Sven Gyro is so good at that, but also even the tide lineup, like if VP are going to push towers, I don't know what the game panned out, but they've got a, a Tide Ravage Gyro with massive AoE team fight. They're happy to have these big engagements from the early game. So to me, these it looks like VP's draft is just so much harder to execute. And I think LDDs are just so much more straightforward, which 
I think yeah. it's a big factor like, how easy a draft is to execute. I think Definitely. it's also timing based. Is that they just got the ags too late on the morphine for it to be relevant, and also yeah. by the time he got the ags, Roger didn't have the highest farm priority or like ex- experience, so it was like level two enchant totem, like no- nothing. You know, the right home about if that's what you're morphing into. He might have even needed the morph into to the um, gyro. But also, yeah. I think a big other turning point was the Sven going third, the way fourth item, uh, Orchid. He went Echo Saber, BKB, Blink, Orchid. And that Orchid did so much work. Yeah, that was a really cool item choice from Army for sure. Um, Looking towards game two now, this was a fun game, but also a really sad game in the way that it was basically decided. Um, <laughs> they or picked... hilarious, depending on the way you look at it. Yeah, depending on how you see it. Um, one of the fun parts about this game was Arme did play a PA, and obviously he is a, a carry that loves PA, very much a comfort for him. He sticks with it through thick and thin. Um, Ramsey's TB, another classic... Um, no one gyro is something that I think is a classic and Pasha Pango so they very much went back to type for the VP um, Ramsey's basically AFK for like 30 minutes in this game just farming 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 doing very well even though LGD are ahead they haven't really touched this this Terrorblade hero he gets Manta he gets BKB and Scardi all at a good time suddenly LGD go to push the bot lane FY's in the trees and just throws out an arrow. It just hits Ramsey's. They follow up with Boat, Torrent. There's no saves on the side of VP, really. Roger can try an Echo Stomp, but they have BKBs by this point in the game. It's late. It's like 35 minutes. And they just nuke this TB. He doesn't have buyback. And they the game is rack. over. They get, the game's over, yeah. They get bot racks, they get mid racks, and they get they get melee, ra- uh, melee racks top. And the game's basically over. And VP uh, Ramsey's just farmed for like 35 minutes for nothing. Um, but off that, of one arrow, <laughs> yeah, off of one arrow. I mean, do you think the game was as simple as one arrow, or I mean, LGD were quite far ahead by that point, Adam? I mean, they were they were comfortably ahead, and then the arrow comes out, and it's just over. I mean, they they yeah. followed up really well to nuke people down during. I always feel like it's hard to kill people during like torrent and timing up everything. They chain stun really well. Mm. with Torrent and Arrow and Ravage to be able to not even let a TB like BKB or have any uh, response. Yeah, they did. I mean, they did get a long arrow, to be fair. Um, but it, did kind of, it kind of seemed like it was shaping up to be an epic game of, all right, Ame's pretty farmed on this PA, and now Ramsey's is really farmed on this TB. Let's see what happens. And then one arrow, okay, that's it. Game over. I mean, it did kind of go on a little bit further, and it got really interesting with Ame's uh, next item choice. But yeah, it uh, it basically ended right there off of one W, which is, I guess, the strength of uh, Marana. It's kind of like a pudge hook. You just fish, fish, fish. Yeah, and, and eventually you, you might land it, yeah. Um, the fact that Terrorblade has got 200 more damage than the position 5. Oh, well, position 4, Elder Titan. Yeah. Signals it's a sad game for the carry. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It was. It looked good for VP, at least from my perspective. They pick Pango for Pasha, a hero that's a weak laner, right? I mean, they were saying this a lot during the draft phase, during the broadcast. But Pasha actually had a really good start. He was the, the highest net worth hero for VP for quite a long time. Um, went Maelstrom, which effectively enables his farm going later into the game a lot. So it looked like it was going to go quite well. Um, but it wasn't long after that that Again, I think Chalice played a great tight hunter. I think a couple of maybe one whiffed Ravage, but other than that, very good. And obviously, Somnus is one of the best Kunkers. And it just seemed they slowly eat this one out until the tipping point, which was that arrow. I mean, Solo started off with a three minute tranquil boot. He had a a killing yeah. streak to start it off. Like he, they were definitely making space and making it happen. Yeah. And it just slowly fell apart. Yeah. So that's that was the first series of the day, VP falling to the you lower You got to talk about the PA build, man. Uh, yeah, okay. He went fourth item axe. <laughs> like yeah. that's and yeah. then he got a then he got a divine. 
Yeah, he got a divine for just. He had no. I mean, it seemed no like reason, he had no yeah. reason to get it. They were five racks ahead, and it's like that just seems like you're going to throw. But then they explained it later, and with the well, like Purge did, what he yeah. theorized what you do is you just have the ags. You're always smoked basically with because the of blur. the cool. Yeah, with the blur, and you just keep throwing out triple daggers until you kill some people, and then you blink strike on somebody with a BKB. So really, you just become like this poke person, and they can never like follow up and catch you. You just keep throwing out triple rapier daggers. And with a, I mean, he had Battle Fury, uh, Deso, and then the rapier. I think he was critting for about thirty three hundred, maybe. Yeah, it was something like that. They they calculated it on the broadcast, and it was something crazy high like that. Um, Yeah, just wait till you one shot Roger and Solo, and then you can blink. Uh, BKB in on like no one or something yeah no it was a really fun PA game in general and the Ags was cool to see Army doesn't care he's played enough PA to know his builds I think it looked good yeah 12 second instant cast blur seems seems strong yeah second series of the day and the last upper bracket Vici Gaming versus TNC we got three games out of this one but I think I don't know what Long games, basically. Vici Gaming and TNC are both teams that are very happy to take this one late. Um, whoops. Yeah, both teams that are very happy to take this one late. First game, it was quite a cool mid matchup with Lena versus Quop. That's just something that I looked at straight away. Um, TNC, they got the win. I thought Fade had a very sad game on Magnus. They kept killing him and DY before they did put, get any spells off in the late game. They just got Newt. Cuckoo played a really good Sand King. He got the Ags buff and was just flying around the map super long range. Um, yeah, that's what I thought about first one. Marco, do you remember much about this one? Yeah, I, I remember being impressed by the Sand King. I felt like Cuckoo made a lot of space, but also in fights, not just damage output, but the control he was doing with Blink, Burrow Strikes and Yules, and then he gets a I'm pretty sure I got an Ags buff later in the game, so he's getting double, triple stuns, and it provided the the lockdown and control necessary for then Quop and Lifesteal to do their thing, and even Tiny Toss damage, that was going mad. Whereas on Vici's side, they have an Ench on the three, and they have this Magnus pick, and so the Ench provides this damage output, but when you got to this super late game point, I felt like control became more of a bigger issue. It's like, can you control the enemy team? Yes, all right, because you're also farmed, you've got the damage to win. But Vici, I felt, lacked that control. The Ench doesn't have any. The Mag, all these RPs, I mean, it's kind of an all or nothing. He got a couple, but then it wasn't good enough. Sanking's getting Burrow Strikes every 10 seconds. Big difference there. And then the last thing that categorizes that game was the Ench going for a bounty rune at like 70 <laughs> minutes. Led to the Ench dying, and then one of his teammates arrives, they die, and then Quop's blinking forward and fearing people, and they die, and it was this classic pub chain of uh, deaths that led to the game finally cracking open and Vici losing. Yeah, who casted the series? It was Toby, Cinderin. Yes. I think. Yeah, and then it was just like, it's, 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 Cinderin was like, they're not worth that much at seven, you know they're worth a lot yeah. of gold but they're not worth the game to like walk in yeah. blind it was and... sloppy really sloppy no offense to to yang but that was the crux of how they lost two and things they... are i no go go we talk about from this game was that there was a point where tim's tim's played really well on four tiny and he got a 16 minute blink pretty cool that he goes four four zero zero build at eight max that blow up then he got a four staff at 25, and then he sat on gold for the next 40 minutes. I guess 36 minutes. He had 11,000 gold. Oh, yeah. And we were just, I was watching with people who were just like, what is what is he going to do? Like, he's got 9K saved up, uh, or 9K of reliable gold. He needs to spend it. He had Octarine Core, like, for 20 minutes in his quick buy, and then he finally went Ags, uh, Daedalus, all at once, and had buyback. And then he kind of became a damage guy, and he eventually did get an Octarine Core later. But that was pretty interesting, that he just yeah. sat... I mean, he had like 18,000 net worth, and 12k of it was gold. 
just yeah. in his. So it was just like, you need to spin this. And then also a uh, big farm fest game. Paparazzi on Jug had just an insane amount of farm. And he got a uh, relatively early, I think, refresher orb at 46 minutes, kind of like fourth item. And one part that was maybe a bit of a throw or a miscommunication was that they were fighting near the mid tier two on Radiant side and paparazzi didn't have Omni slash he had it on cooldown, but he had the, the um, refresher backpacked and then Faye jumps in and gets the sick two man RP, but paparazzi doesn't have refresh for the Omni slash. So he moves the, the refresher back into his like um, inventory, but then he has to wait six seconds to refresh. And by that point, like the windows closed. If he just had um, refresh Omni slash open, I think they just like win the fight, maybe even win the game. It was an unfortunate, that was like pretty late, probably about an hour in the game ended up being 76 minutes. Yeah. And it was a great come from uh, behind because there was a point where um, Marco knew this result before I did. And we were watching it, and I said, "Oh, um, oh, so T- so Vici Gaming win, right? Because they had a 12k advantage at 30 minutes, and in Power Jug, it feels like that infinitely scales with RP. It's like a guaranteed one team fight." And the, when the answer was no, I was like, "Okay, I've got to watch the rest of this game then." And like you say, in the end, it came down to this control factor. I think more than anything, Tiny and Sanking particularly just providing so much lockdown and nullifier once the Life Stealer picks it up along with Hex and all the rest of it from Queen of Pain. Yeah, Joke Magnus is obviously this iconic duo, but I, I always feel a bit uh, unsure about it because the window of opportunity for you to like deal all the damage you can and to like win a team fight, I feel largely rests in this RP duration and this Omni Slash duration. And A, Omni Slash can go haywire and be ineffective very easily. And then B, RP, can, you can play around it. It might not even get off. You might only get two heroes. And so it feels like all or nothing on that working. On the other hand, if you have like a life stealer or a corp sanking, which is what TNC had, you can just brawl for longer and repeat your spells and you're not confined to hitting a successful RP Omni Slash. So I, I do like the TNC draft that they had and the fact that they took it that late, I felt really confident in them to... I think the draft going late definitely wins, so they did yeah. well in draft yeah. and gameplay. Lifestealer Jug 1v1 outside of Omni Slash, like Lifestealer stomps that. So that's yeah. what you said. I, Just kite the Omni and then win. I think when you see Jug mag lineups, they succeed when the Jug just has so much damage from Empower and Farm that he doesn't just rely on Omni Slash. And when it when it is all about that RP Omni Slash, like it often is, like what Marco was saying then they can definitely get unstuck, especially as the game goes later. Um, so looking towards game two, um, are you playing AA again and only dying five times again in a really long game? <laughs> just I just noticed that. That's quite fun. This was... <laughs> I remember this game for whiffed spells, personally, because um, I know Tim's completely whiffed an Echo Slam bot and also Yang had, I think, at least one completely whiffed Tidehunter. Um, Ravage. Um, this game went super late as well. Uh, TNC looked really good because the Bristleback was basically unkillable for a while, but I felt like the team fights, my memory of this game is the team fights were very kind of disjointed from TNC with Razor and AA and Earthshaker fighting, say, two heroes and Bristleback running up after three in the back and just sort of getting kited around. Um, I think this game really illustrates the the downside to a Bristleback in the one role. Like, you, if you look at the post-game stats, you see that Earthshaker did 22.5k damage, Bristleback only did 7k more damage. And throughout the entire game, you can see Bristleback and say, wow, this guy's a beast, this guy hits hard, hundreds, this guy is so tanky, can't die. So, oh, this surely is going to be a great hero, a great pick. But then, in reality, these team fights. The Bristleback's kind of struggling to to hit targets and he's a, kind of a slow hero and VG were kiting him super well and it just means he can't output any damage like your typical position one should do. Mm. It's interesting because they have a split damage source because Razor and Bristleback are the position one and two. They want 
longer drawn out fights. Maybe not super long, but like reasonably long. Bristol's not a burst hero, neither's Razor. But yet the rest of their heroes, AA, Tiny, Urshaker, they're like instant burst. So even if you land a great echo and ice blast, at, if it's an hour long game. You could do with a position one or two that can instantly follow up with a big burst. Or just a Shadow Demon that can do Soul Catcher, but unfortunately, Vici had the Shadow Demon in this one. Um, Adam, would you have thoughts on this game too? Mm, this one, just kind of a bit forgettable. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like a long game. I think you, everybody hit the nail on the head. It's like Tim's was a little bit Rambo on the Earthshaker. I think you said like he missed a few echoes, but then he also would have really good fights with Fissures, and I think. They're just a bit uncoordinated. Yeah, and then, I agree. Yeah, then the late game, the uh, they just get outscaled by like you know Shadow Demons, a sick late game support. Fade on Rubik, that's a great late game support. It's really funny though. Fade would like I watched an entire team fight where the uh, like Rubik didn't have a spell stolen because he like respawned. and he just didn't steal anything the entire fight, and it, it turned out fine. They won. It's like he was just waiting, I guess for that fissure to come out so he could get it. Right. And he and he just never did it. And then the, the fight was over and he finally stole tree volley from the um the tiny. Yeah. Final game of the series then. This was much shorter than the others, just thirty five minutes. Which is quite normal for a Dota series, but not this one. Um, it's also funny because it's the Ori Snorri <laughs> the classic Medusa yeah. and it's the shortest game by far. Yeah, the classic, the the Vici Gaming Special, ROTK Special. Oh, did you see the post-game interview where um, it was Fade doing an interview with Casey and Fade actually speaks pretty good English. And Casey asks, what did ROTK say to you when the Broodmother last pick came out because he was really animated? And Fade, I think, didn't quite understand the question or at least thought maybe they just said, what did ROTK say before your last pick? Mm-hmm. Rather than what Casey asked was like TNC's Brood pick. And he just said, Oh, ROTK, he just said Medusa. He just said Medusa. And I was like, yep, that's Vici Gaming in a nutshell right there. <laughs> that's the last pick, just say Medusa. ROTK knows. Um, this game was a confusing one for me because it's TNC, they pick Brood on 22. So you'd presume it's a really good Brood game. But then they just let Centaur go mid, I guess. They don't want to put Brood in a side lane, which is and I Centaur guess. Centaur stomps the lane. It's, it's such an easy. Centaur matchup. I, I don't think Armel is a great Broodmother player, particularly. He's not. I uh, mean, when you think of Broodmother players, you don't think of Armel. But even so, even if it was a great Broodmother player, you're picking a 22 pick Brood into one of the hardest Brood counters in Centaur. It um, might not even yeah. be based off of the mid matchup, though. It's like they should have just 2 1 2 the lanes. They, they aggressive tried with Grimstroke, Tiny, and uh, Jug, and they got kills, but then. Bottom, they just had a solo Earthshaker losing to Lashrak and Shadow Demon, and they just like disrupt in the stomp or in the, in the split Earth, and they just they end up basically instead of they knew mid was going to be hard, and they're like, okay, let's win one lane well, and then we're just going to sack two of the lanes. Is basically well, I think, what ended up I think they thought they could win mid, and also the the grim part about. Going all in to kill this Ori Snorri Medusa in the lanes with the tri lane. It's like Ori's going to be AFK for 25 minutes anyway. So sure, he's going to be AFK with less farm and he's going to come out later. But it's not as if you're shutting down some tempo controller that's going to really run the mid game. Yeah, he's just going to go jungle and like Fade's running around, you know, stacking three camps at a time as Shadow True, Demon. Yeah. It's just like, okay. And Paparazzi yeah, Lashrak definitely... ended up 10 0 10. So yeah, they put way too much time and effort into that try lane against Dusa and that didn't get enough out of it for sure and it's, it's just weird because they surely had to re- recognize bottom's going to lose but how can you not think that centaur's at least going to go equal with brood mid so it was strange strategic laning um the notable shout out i would give is to paparazzi in his left so yes he had an easy time because basically he had a free lane from five minutes but then his rotations um top lane mostly so when TNC have got this tri lane going ham. T- Paparazzi would TP in and just clean up, and he had free farm already. He then TPs to these rotations and cleans up, and 10 0 10, he was just, he had a perfect game, really. Um, yeah, they dove that tier one top, 
And since, you know, Lesh had a free lane, he was already level six against these like really under leveled tri lane supports. He just yeah. TPs in, Pulse Novas just kills everybody. It's weird because even if the tri lane that they did with the joke against the Deusa, even if that went really well and they killed Deusa, what, maybe a couple more times? Okay, you get a bit of gold, like 200 gold more per kill. You get some XP from the kill, but at the end of the day, you're still going to have these under-leveled supports, like your Grimstroke and your Tiny. Meanwhile, Vici are just are stacking loads. They've got 2 on 2 It still feels like the best-case scenario isn't that good, so why did they want to do it in the first place? It was kind of odd, honestly. And also felt weird that Cuckoo, I forgot about that until you mentioned it, they killed him once or twice, maybe, bought him, and then he left. He went and jungled yeah, the yeah. radiant top triangle, and it's like, oh, you're actually just sacking safe lane in this be- this third game. Like, you yeah, are giving could- Paparazzi a free lane. Literally. And-, and no one is even soaking these creeps for experience. Like, oof. Also, what I'd say is, you want to put pressure on Ori Snorri do so, sure, but that doesn't mean you have to kill him time and time again. Because do so... It- He's got low HP pool, but still a bit of tankiness with his mana shield. You don't need to dive and commit everything to kill him. You can just win the CS war. If he's not last hitting, he's still not getting gold. You don't have to point him to the grave. You could just dominate the laning and the CS and not have to bring a third hero and be diving towers. So over and all, I don't really... TNC's like, whole approach to the game was a, was a bit wonky. Um, the last thing I would say is... Third game in a row, they pick Fade as Pulsefire Shadow Demon, first pick of uh, every draft. So, um, and that was very strong every every draft. As we know, Shadow Demon is a monster. Yeah, monster. One of the well, probably the premier pick yeah. of the tournament so far. Um, and yeah, all in agreement. Bit of a weird one tactically from TNC there, and they fall down to the lower bracket. No script Spe- stroke combos either. What was the? It? For eight, they picked Grimstroke, right? And then it's like they didn't have any. They had like yeah. spawn spider links. <laughs> that was. Yeah. That's like it. <laughs> um, looking to the lower bracket, um, first lower bracket series, RNG versus Alliance. Probably the most hype matchup. Very sad game in general. Marco, big Alliance fan. I mean, I wanted Alliance as well, no doubt. RNG, not really particularly. I mean, they're a pretty new roster, all in all, so no one, not many fans, I suppose, outside of China. And then I feel like, should we just talk, should we talk, talk about, about the, the mistake the that mistake? came out yeah. after the, after the game? Like, Insania just is very, uh, what's the, he's just, he just came out and said it. <laughs> like, what happened? Yeah. So I'll, I'll run it through. Um, we were wondering at the time, why is Alliance not last band of hero? They haven't banned a hero. I guess it would be on 20. Um, their final ban, they just haven't used. I was unsure if it was a visual bug or not, because where you see the hero that is banned, it was just black and empty. And so I was like, if you don't use your time, do you just random ban? Like, you might random pick in pick phase, or have they banned but not updated the hero icon? I was a bit confused at first, but then, like you'll say, we kind of realised what had happened. Yeah. Um, they pick Gyro... Which, to us at the time, made no sense. To us. They've already got Mickey's hero in the void. Suddenly there's a gyro. Mickey doesn't really play gyro. And then they've got this void hero that I guess Boxy's playing. I've never seen that before. It didn't really make any sense. It felt like a guaranteed Ogre Magi pick, at least to me, um, at the end there. I'd be really interested to hear what they would pick. But I felt like they were definitely just going to pick Boxy Ogre Magi, and then they have a Bloodlust Solar Crest Void. It's really good. They've got Quake for Storm. And it felt like a classic Alliance lineup until this Gyro sort of turns it into this funky offlane void, mid Storm, Pos 1, Mickey Gyro. And despite all these mistakes, they still definitely could have won this game, for sure. It was a very competitive one until RNG basically just like a chain kind of feed down the mid lane, right? I mean... Well, did you say what the mistake was? Oh, the, they but meant they, to ban it, Gyro. Yeah, they, they meant to ban. They picked it, yeah. Yeah, and I guess what happens is, if it, people haven't done captain's mode really, is when you run out of reserve time, it just skips the... Like, for a ban, it skips it, 
and it'll mm-hmm. go to your pick for an actual hero. And I guess he got down to the last second to ban Gyro, and it went from ban to real hero pick, and they picked Gyro. It's like big oof. And then if you want to go to the very end of the Twitch VOD, they have actually in the booth audio of what happened. And they're that pretty was shook. awesome, yeah. That yeah. was a great... Mo- that's so cool that they've got that sort of capability just for content. That they've got true sight basically for every game. So cool. Um, in terms of the game itself though, uh, Marco, we were cheering for Alliance. They don't manage to do it. What what were the standout things for you do you think about this game? Um, it's hard to say standout because they ultimately lost, which is super gutting. I think they're doing really well in the first 20. Boxy on this rogue void offlane pick was doing good work. Like his first chronosphere was amazing. It saved uh, Mickey and got kill on the enemy mid lane or core. Some crazy productive chrono. Koifu was doing good work in the in the early game as well. Once he got Paltrez, Kaya who's getting involved in fights and kills. Game was kind of looking fine, but then there was a couple moments. I think it was Lan M getting some big split earth turnaround kills. For example, that happened once on Storm and Void, where they were committing for an Ember or an anti mage, didn't quite get the kill, and then they both get double stunned and the gang turns around. So there's a couple moments like that, but all through the game for about 40 minutes. So Alliance had the lead, but then it got clawed back, and it, it was very balanced, and they were starting to pick up key items like. Oh, Storm gets his BKB and Gyro did start to get fat, Butterfly, Satanic, even got an MKB. So you're watching the game going, yeah, this isn't super normal alliance because the, the picks are obviously a bit off, like with Mickey, but they've got the tools to win. And so then it was just devastating. This skirmish in the mid lane at the river happens where it's just a one by one. I think they commit or they don't commit and they get one hero kill, the anti mage kind of blow everything they don't buy back no, and void dies but then anti-mage buys back maybe ember buys back i'm not sure but he has ag so they chase they literally just chase alliance down the entire mid lane to the tier three cleaning up kill by kill by kill and then the game's over because they didn't have buybacks back. and it was just super gutting because in the span of a minute you go from this is a really contested game could go either way i i felt like alliance had had the edge but then it just blew up and they lose and it's just gg yeah, it was really close. Like Monet definitely that time when he blinked forward, he didn't get he got, throw, le- yeah. he got level twenty five mana void instead of the magic damage or magic resistance, and then he like blinks in, gets chronoed, he just dies. And you're like, oh man, the Alliance are doing it. And then it's like what you said. I thought and see I I went to sleep in between the upper bracket and lower bracket. Woke up, I kind of fast forwarded through the draft. I didn't know anything about the ban pick thing. And I was like, oh, off- Offlane Void, this is kind of cool. And it looked sick. I thought they picked it because the um, time dilation is so strong against Shadow Demon and Abaddon and Ember Spirit and yeah. uh, like AM. And it was doing so much work. It totally wrecks Abaddon. And it was a core Abaddon. So you just time dilate. And then if he's already popped shield, he's useless for yeah. a really long period of time. And he, he got so many really knife edge uh pixely perfect chronos to save people but also get kills uh but the big turning points were i think the two lanum splitters the one time you said they tried to kill an ember spirit and they blew everything just it was like a two-man gank it was storm and void and they blew everything uh setsu ember has like a full stick or full wand or something so he barely gets out because lanum TP's in, and he hits two heroes with a level two split earth, which is so small. Yeah. And, and he double stuns them. And then the other time was the mid top Roshan area, and he double stunned a storm spirit and maybe a gyro, either a gyro or a void, but the storm balls in to save, and then the split earth just happens uh, when it lands. Yeah. It, it just, we were, yeah, we were talking about that. There was one, there was two Quake for Death to split earth. One of them at the start, I'm so certain he could have electric vortexed the Lesh during ball lightning as he comes across, and he would have survived and stopped the split earth. Um, and then the other one top where he... That was more unfortunate. He just, just zips in and gets insta-split earth as soon as the zip ends. 
and ends up dying without buyback, that being right at the end. Um, it's interesting because, yeah, on the surface, this boxy void looks really nice um, because, like you say, there's some of the chronos where, you know, he clips them and let, leaves the storm out to do damage and all that. That was really cool. Offensively, obviously, void offlane's incredible because chrono and void is a great offensive hero. But at the same time, they're missing this this tanky say ogre or whatever centaur, this tanky offlane hero on boxy that can soak spells and be more forward in the team fights. Split Earth and Searing Chains destroyed Alliance in this game because it, if you think about those two spells, those are both basically two man disables the way Lanham was playing anyway. There's so much value against all of Alliance's heroes. It's like the spell value in this game for RNG was massively inflated because of this mispick gyro that's a similar kind of core than the Void and the Storm already, just all offense, basically. Um, so that's how I saw that one going, and obviously Alliance dropping down is sad to see. Yeah, you wonder what they would have picked, and you also wonder what with what they would have picked, would they have picked AM in response? Probably not. So it would have been a completely different game. Yeah, Monet does like his AM, but yeah, they probably, I'm sure they pick differently if they're faced with a different lineup, probably. Um, the Liquid versus Fnatic, this, I mean, if you told me this was an upper bracket game before this event started, I would have said sure. I mean, they're pretty star studded lineups. Um, and this game was actually quite fun, I thought, all in all. Um, Liquid getting the victory, though, uh, on the back of, an incredible mind control tide, my standout in general. <laughs> and it's funny as well, with in a best of one uh, backs against the wall liquid game, <laughs> they pick Weeha and Necrophos, which is like a Matumba classic hero. It's a green hero, of TI7 classic. So I thought that was just quite funny. Um, kind of sad to see Fnatic go home this early. Uh, I think they choked a little bit. It's all on DJ's back. Yeah, he alluded to a little bit of choke. It was definitely all on the Enigma's back. I think the Timber pick, uh, classic Ice 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 hero, but mm, it didn't... I mean, it was top net worth at some points in the game, but it was never really a major threat. And like you say, it was kind of all on these big black holes to, to do the work. I also feel like Fnatic did make a couple of mistakes. Uh, one big example was Liquid killed Ice 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 bottom, but then Fnatic were kind of coming in to give him backup, but don't get there before he dies, but then still decide to try and make some surprise, spontaneous engagement against Liquid, despite the fact it's 4v5, and Liquid kind of go, okay then, and just wipe them. And it felt to me like a really, really poor decision making. And I think there was a couple other kind of slips from Fnatic in the game. Liquid, on the other hand, Mind Control was solid on his tide. He was really smart in his laning. He got a really good timing blink and made some really good counter initiations with Ravage. And then Miracle, he didn't crack at all. His gyro, like his hero control, mouse movement, dodging these black holes. And like when they were hitting the throne and he was dodging spells there, he was really, really on point. So kudos to Liquid, definitely deserve the win. Any thoughts on this one, Adam? Uh, it was a little bit back and forth. I thought Fnatic had stabilized, but then when that black hole's down, they just can kind of run at you. And Fnatic, or uh, DJ just, he kind of whiffed his last two black holes and it, it's just kind of over at that point. Yeah, they he went for some, you know, edge black holes on Miracle. And I think at least twice in the game, Miracle just, I guess, preemptively sees the situation arising and just moves his hero slightly. Um, and that slight, you know, mouse movement yeah. basically wins them the team fight because Gyro doesn't get caught. He so yeah, uh, just doesn't even need to relocate. The first, I think, is... I guess I'm not thinking of the black holes in the base, but the ones around Roche. Uh, the, he, like, first black hole didn't hit anything, like a complete with, and then he had yeah. to, like, refresh, and then he solo black holed one person. It was like, ugh, rough. Yeah. Rough way to go out, especially for some... And he was the top net worth hero for Fnatic because yeah. he's DJ. Yeah. It felt good for them at the start because they because they have Ice 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 who can lane 1v2 again. Well, it was 1v no one after Mind Control went and, you know, creep cut by the tier 3 on Tide, which 
basically went unanswered for most of the laning stage. So they have DJ just farming woods, and it's like they've got four cores versus three, so it seems good for them. But like you said, as the game goes on, it get, basically gets unstuck. Um, so Liquid move on, which I think a lot of people will be happy about. Um, uh, one funny thing was that Mountain Control at the laning stage was sat behind the dire, like the opposite lanes, tier two and tier three. He was just hugging yeah. the tier three, just yeah. creep cutting his tide. That was pretty funny. Yeah. Um. So Infamous versus King Gaming... I must admit, I skipped this game. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of time. So, Adam, you've got to carry us through this game. Infamous. Yeah. Get the victory. So SA was, Dream. SA Dream. Uh, Peru Dota. <laughs> yeah. This was a 34-minute game. Um, relatively high. Is a, a kill a minute. 21 to 30. Or 21 to 13. So 34 kills in 34 minutes. Most of these games had less than that. They're kind of bore fests. Um, right. I'm not saying this was the most exciting game, but at least people were like heroes were dying, yeah, and and getting kills. Um, yeah, just mostly. Keen had like a solid foothold, I would think. It was even on net worth, but it felt like uh, they had really shut down Hector's Wraith King. Like he had a very late i mean it's like a 12 minute minus which is pretty late he died and then they just infamous tried to make space all over the map basically right. the tusk was dying all over the place it felt like uh it felt like batrider would have died as a support five position but he was one zero and 15 but he was also cutting waves enchantress was tanking ganks um just making space for the, the wraith king to come online and then then he went um, Radiance at 19, immediately got a 22-minute Blade Mail, and then they just kind of ran. They just kind of ran up in King Gaming's face and just kind of took it to him. It was really funny that the draft, I think, led off with Enchantress' first pick, and then Keen for uh, for Infamous, and Keen immediately followed up with PA Witch Doctor, which is actually quite good against... Um, Enchantress. And then they knew on Infamous's side that they were had, going to be against a PA, and then they just kept picking things that PA was decent against, which was pretty funny. Yeah. Just looking at the draft, it seems to me like King Gaming, all their damage is on PA, because Konka goes Spirit Vessel Halberd, doesn't even go down a Radiance route or even a Crit route in the yeah. game. So, Spirit, and then Spirit you Vessel got... was smart. That was a big brain item buy. Against the, that, the, well, against the Enchantress, it completely yeah. shut him down. And then also, it's really good against Refraction and, and the TA. Um, yeah. Uh, That's I, true. I'm not really so feeling the, Keen Gaming's draft. I, sounds I like, would, yeah, you've got some utility from Spirit Vessel, but then they've got this very much four protect one around PA has to do everything. But if you look at items, okay, PA at 20, say 20 to 25, PA's got Battle Fury Dezo, so you're powerful to crit people, but you're vulnerable. I guess you go, okay, the Omni Knight is going to save you. But on the other hand, you've got Infamous with a Wraith King having Raidy Blade Mail, two lives. But then you've also got a TA with Blink, Dezo, BKB, both of them outputting major damage. I don't think an Omni Knight can stop that. I don't think Kunker's Vessel is really stopping that either. I don't think Doc's stopping that. I don't think Rubik's stopping that. feels to me that Infamous just get to 20 minutes and go, all right, if we've got our farm... We can just roll. Yeah, they just weathered the storm. I've been yeah. seeing a lot of Kunkas do like weird, for, like first item Lotus Orb, first item. I mean, it's pretty standard. If you think it's just going to roll over the game, you just be really tanky. It does make Kunka really tanky that a spirit vessel. I think there's I think... too too much, uh, too, like 11 as the Omni Knight. He had to do too much in this game. Yeah. Right. Right. It seems like a sick toss game to me, looking at their lineup and what Marco just said. A hero that's going to enable you to get kills in, at minute 20 when you have this spike. Yeah, Tusk and Batrider for infamous. Tusk just flying in. Two bracers, really hard to kill. And even laning. I mean, Doc, Rubik, Kunker, and Omni like all pretty much hate this Tusk. I don't know how much work he did do in the game, but it seems like a good pick to me. But I mean, the they, just, their team. they just grouped up and kind of ran, and the Keen fell apart. It's like... The practice. 
They would jump on a support, and Omni would try and save the support, and then you don't have anything to save PA. And then it just kind of right, right. ended. The, my final point was that, so it was a 12-minute Radiant on Wraith King, like you said, and then seven minutes later, he's completed Radiance. Sorry, 12-minute Midas, seven minutes later, he's completed Radiance. That is phenomenally good timing. Because to get a 90-minute Radi, you'd think that's good timing, and you'd imagine that would come with like a an eight-minute yeah, Midas. Yeah, like seven, eight-minute Midas. Oh, yeah. Four, I think they just said... Seven-minute gap to get those. That's phenomenal. They basically just said... I'm, he said it probably, I'm not coming to anything. You guys yeah. make space, and he just farmed for that seven minutes. He did not even make an attempt. And they were leaking kills all over, and it was like, ooh, this is kind of looking rough. But yeah, then, if, even then, you'd expect, if, if I saw that with that Midas time and with that Raidy timing, I'd be like, oh, he got a triple kill, and he's farming forever. Uh, yeah, I would have thought he got kills. But also in that time period, TA's farm as well, she was, that's a period of time where she needs to get her Dezo BKB blink as well, so the fact that he was able to find farm, I don't know what Infamous did. Pretty impressive. And I know that Stan mentioned that this one player for Infamous has been highlighted by the analysts as Heck some, to God. some like upcomer. Yeah. So that's interesting. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, remembering, I, I think back on the game, I think it was really on the Batrider, Tusk, and Enchantress because you uh, TA was on one side of the map farming the triangle and then... <laughs> Wraith King was on the other side of the map, farming yeah. the jungle in the lane, pushing out with skeletons. And then, it's what you said, 19-minute uh, Radiance, and then 18-minute BKB on the TA, and then they went. And it was looking very like they could get rolled over because you got two cores that are so farm-reliant, just like yeah. not coming to anything. And then they finally showed up. They took a four-man fight, and then all of a sudden, this Wraith King TPs in with her with the Radi done. It's like, oh, okay, now they just win. They just roll yeah. over it. It's so interesting as well, sorry to drag out this game, but the thing that Kyle mentioned about Hector in the group stages is literally exemplified in this game. He said if you stop monitoring uh, Hector's net worth, you look away for five minutes and you look back, it's 5k higher than you think it's going to be. So I guess this makes sense like with the Midas Radi timings seemingly being outrageously short, the distance between those two items. Yeah, um, Infamous is big on stacks, and then... Yeah. I feel like there's one other thing I want. Oh, uh, skeletons maybe in your well in your in your PA or, or in your uh, pubs. Don't initiate on the Wraith King because this is actually the theme of the next two games. I think this <laughs> game and the next one is. Hey, you see a Wraith King alone? Probably don't want to just like jump on him and blow everything on the first life. Yeah, or an ogre. I thought in this game as well, just particularly at the end that the final attempt from Zayak to. You know, Ags oh, kicked yeah. the ogre into the base. That went well, badly. But yeah, the game we're in question is uh, Na'Vi versus Mineski, with Mineski getting a win. Another long one here, hour long. And I, this was a bit of a snooze fest. This kill score is incredibly low, and it was really low for a large part of the game. Both teams just farming up, both fancying themselves late game. Um, the lineups were Warlock, Sven, Sniper, Earth Spirit, Beastmaster versus... Ogre, Shadow Demon, Enigma, Lena, Wraith King. And I say that just out of interest because I think both teams thought they had better late game or at least better late mid game, that kind of 30 minute mark plus. Um, hence why they were both playing so passively. And it's a lower back at breast of one, of course. I know that um, announcers are like really dogging the Mineski lineup. They thought they didn't really have a chance if it went late. And then it turns out Mineski gets a 50k lead at the end of the game. Yeah. I think they both teams did have kind of competent late game lineups. I think the biggest difference was that Moon on the Lena for Mineski did oh, 10 times more work than Magical on the Sniper. So a, a common theme of the late game fights, the few that happened was Lena BKBs, blinks forward, Ags, ults, Sniper, 1000 damage for his BKB, peps him a few times, the Sniper's either dead or forced out the fight, and then Lena would kind of scurry away with her speed and I always felt like Magical on his sniper wasn't doing any enough in these fights whereas Moon to me stood out as doing like big big work and then yeah the rest of the team fight does what it wants and yeah Mineski claw, claw, claw it out and there's also that other turning point in the game 
which is, I think, the one main talking point about when Na'Vi, they got bottom racks. I don't know if you watched this, Adam. They get bottom racks and then decide to go for the throne. Very aggressive, rather than just going back for shrines or going for another okay. lane of racks. Not or even surely they could have got fight. another lane, right? They didn't they need... They could have got top, not mid. Yeah, so mid. Mid. Okay. top tier two was dead top, for sure. It's kind of sad, because if mid was available... Then it's they likely take they, they, they would just have done it, on yeah. mid, but they think, oh, we don't want to go all the way from bottom to top racks. Mm. Oh, we don't want to retreat because there were long cooldowns still on the enemy respawns. But then they got they two tier fours. Two mm. tier fours. It, it was only 30 minutes in the game or something, so you're not at a point where you can just melt the throne. It's a very chunky building. They had ages on sniper. They felt like they can do stuff, yeah, and then they but... kind of like lost some people, and then. People got oh, out fight. and just left yeah. sniper. It was frustrating because most of them, or maybe half of them, were focused on hitting the throne. Meanwhile, um, Mineski players were respawning. When I think, yeah, they've got Aegis, just shape for killing enemy heroes when they respawn. Like, if they step out of Fountain, commit everything you've got onto killing them because you're at this 2 3 hero advantage. But instead, they wouldn't focus heroes. They'd be like, let's keep, keep going in buildings and then. Moon, uh, Mineski would do everything they could to take down heroes one by one. They did so. Na'Vi would then put on the back foot. 30 minutes later, they, they lose. So pretty sad for the CIS team. Yeah, I do think, dare I say it, perhaps some inexperience, some nerves yeah. from Na'Vi because I think, first of all, I mean, both teams played really passively, so maybe this is too harsh, but I think in general, the more experienced you are at playing at TI and playing at big events, the less curled up passive you're going to play um, just in general in the, in the lanes and in the mid game and then also I think a more experienced team doesn't just go for thrown there it's almost like the springboard we've been passive all game and suddenly we're taking racks and oh my I, I think we can do tier 4 and then everyone everyone no one wants to make a bold call or whatever so they're just like yeah tier 4 go 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 like we win they looked so um, happy on those cameras fun. at that point really yeah <laughs> um but yeah, game goes long and Moon... I know it's quite common to go Blink early as Lena against a Sniper, but just going phase Yule's Blink, that's a cool Lena build. That's a, you know, no fear Lena build. Um, going for that rather than getting like a BOTs or a Shivas or like a Lincolns or an Ags earlier. Um, that's very, you know, aggressive. So that's quite cool to see. And like Marco said, Moon played really, really well in this game. Um, I thought you- Nick... Go on. Or how do you pronounce Earth, Earth Spirit's player name? Zayak. Zayak? Zayak. Or is it Zayak? Yeah. Or Zayak? I thought they were saying it differently. But yeah, that Yule's wrecked Earth Spirit. Yeah. You blink Yule's Earth Spirit and then kill him. And I thought yeah. he was a little ballsy. A little too ballsy in the game. He was diving a tier two and he kind of just died solo. The Earth early Spirit. And then, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I watched Na'Vi a fair bit in the groups and Zayak Earth Spirit was like the absolute source. It was one of the four deadly core heroes that they used to pick as much as they can. Oh, I know it was. I know he's really good at it. It's just like he seemed a little too eager I, yeah, it's to make hard, stuff happen. Part, I, yeah, I don't disagree. Part of me wonders maybe if this was a group stage game, whether the rest of his team would have been a bit more, you know, balls to the wall with him. It's hard to say. Yeah. Um, or maybe he just was a bit too eager to like, Make a little bit this. too far forward. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to say. Um, but yeah, that was the undoing of of Navi in the end. No El Clasico. Even not a lot ones. of a no big holes. It was kind of a quiet performance from KP Enigma. He didn't even get BKB until really late because they had Roar and uh, oh, Earth Spirit yeah. Silence, and then like assassinate, like really hard to uh, get off a hole. But I yeah. think with it going so late, Raging Potatoes, Shadow Demon really shined. He had the Ags, so he he went like core. He basically went core Shadow Demon build. So he had mm-hmm. a bunch of like all the poison um, buffs, and then he got the Ags. So he had three demonic purges, and that was really huge. Later purging yeah. through BKB on Crystallize and Magical. Yeah, they actually, Shadow Demon actually got an axe this game, rather in the Vici series, where they try and give Shadow Demon axe and then Life Stealer takes it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was Assimilate, funny. very cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was day one. 
long day. I don't know how long the broadcast one, but it felt like about 12 hours or something. Uh, it was like 14. 14, wasn't it? Yeah. 14 hours, Crazy. goodness me. Yeah. The 14-hour VOD. And yeah. the, the Vici TNC series, just in game time, was a little bit under three hours. So it's probably like a three-and-a-half-hour stretch just for that upper bracket. Ridiculous. Is that right? Over three hours? Oh, no, sorry, just under three hours. Just under three, but then with, like, drafts and, like, yeah, breaks yeah. in between. and then, ages, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think you'll let us off if this pod's run a little long because the day ran super long as well. It's the longest um, game or day of the tournament, for sure. For sure, yeah. And, I mean, tomorrow I'm super excited. Team Secret versus, o- versus EG, that's huge. And then OG Newbie, that's also massive. And then I think we get VP, RNG, and TNC Liquid also, all tomorrow. Yeah, that's another big day. Um, so yeah, much vo- more to look forward to. All be a threes. Yeah, all be a threes. Rip best of ones. But yeah, come back tomorrow for another new Meta Podcast Daily. And we'll see you then. <laughs>